Very excited for this one. So what I've got for you today is a best of seven show match that was recently put on by the Chinese StarCraft 2 community. Because of that, spawning right here in the top left corner of game number one on a map called Oceanborn. We're looking at none other than Oliveira's main command center. Oliveira, of course, the world champion of StarCraft 2 in 2023, but he also just so happens to be from China. So I can imagine that he's got a lot of fans cheering for him in this particular series. That being said though, I'm very excited to see especially how his opponent does, because spawning right here with the blue Zerg pieces, we have the man who's considered to be one of the greatest StarCraft II players of all time, but he only just very recently came back from his mandatory military service. We're looking at a rogue's main base. Alrighty, so Rogue going up against Oliveira. Now, don't get me wrong, Oliveira, in my mind, the clear favorite going into this. He is, well, a very strong Terran player, of course. He's a current competitor. Whereas Rogue, at the time of him playing this particular series, which I believe was played on the 5th of April, I think he just came back. I think this is within, like, three or four days of him coming back home from his military service. Now... Right around that same time frame, he did also play that series against Nightmare that I uploaded to my YouTube channel. And I gotta say, I was pleasantly surprised. I expected him to be very rusty, and other than the strategies that he played, so I think his builds were kind of outdated and just his transitions weren't really up to the 2024 standard. He was playing things that we used to see a year and a half or so ago. I mean, the changes are relatively minor, but you can see them really accumulated throughout that series against Nightmare. But Macro and micro-wise, I was impressed. Yeah, Rogue certainly didn't look very rusty. He was just playing some strategies that, yeah, I think we can all consider to be a little old. But that shouldn't really be that complex, right? I mean, if your macro is suffering, if your micro is suffering, that's usually a little bit more telling. But strategies, especially when you're a pro gamer, I mean, those can be adjusted pretty rapidly. So I think Rogue may have had another day or two in between that series and this one. So let's see how much improvement the man can make in like 48 hours or so. It's gonna be a quick triple hatch here. Now it is of course gonna be a Terran versus Zerk. That other series was a Zerk versus Protoss. I was thinking right before I started this cast here, what exactly has changed as far as the like meta goes in Terran versus Zerk over the last year and a half? I guess, broadly speaking, we have had a couple of minor changes, but nothing all too crazy. Right? So, for example, the double Evo chamber before Lair style has fallen out of favor a little bit. But other than that, I mean, that's still a build we see from time to time. Terrans don't really play anything wildly different, although we do see, obviously, those transitions from Ghosts into Liberators quite a bit. And that is not something we really had like a year and a half or so ago. No, he's not going to get the creep tumor here. It's going to be Hellions on the back of this, by the way. Link Speed is going to finish up, so that Reaper is going to have to run. Well played right here by Oliveira. I would say the main change is the way that the late game is played, where now we see, like, upwards of, like, a dozen command centers with orbital commands on them, and then rather than going Ghost Mech, which is still viable and it is still played, we do seem to see a lot more Ghost with Liberator and then some Marine Marauder type of army compositions. But... I mean, if Rogue can survive for that long, I think that's, that's already going to be a personal win. Anyways, let's see. We'll find out over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, the, the next couple of games. Now, this could certainly be a very long match as well. I have purposely not looked at the replay duration here of any of these games. Mostly just because I don't want to be spoiled too much. And, well, <laughs> I've got about two and a half hours to record this. But a best of seven series. Of course, that means that the first player to win four maps is the victor of the series. But look at the look at the movement right here on the queens, right? For just a moment. So we have an overlord leading the creep. We've got multiple control groups of queens. It looks like we may have three of them. With yeah, we have a, a control group of queens that are injecting bases, and then we have a, a group over here, a group over there. I think this is all very solid. Rogue, by the way, really powering out a ton of drones, and so far, okay, following the rule of one gas. Yep, now he fires up a bunch of gases all at the same time. This is something that, if you've taken any StarCraft II coaching over the years, right? I know some people think that's ridiculous, taking coaching for a video game. How can you do that? Anyways, the rule of one gas is one of the basic principles of playing Zerk. So in a way, this is like Rogue going back to basics. But the idea is that you take only a single Vespian Geyser, and you basically saturate all three mineral lines first before you add on any gas. That's exactly what Rogue did here. So, rule of one gas, started up the lair, 
And then when he finally had full mineral saturation on three bases is when he fired up four additional gas geysers here. Always nice to go back to those basics. It's gonna be Evo Chambers on the back of this, Baneling Nest as well. All of this should be a okay. As far as the early game opener goes, yeah, Terran does a lot more variety these days. So this is a bit of a weird combination of units. And maybe something that's a bit uncommon right here for Rogue. Loses one queen, second queen goes down, and I think he's actually gonna lose a little bit more, yeah. This is one of those things that wasn't played so much a year and a half ago, where Terran just goes for a bunch of random stuff, right? There's a lot of these, like, weird random pushes. Good transfusion right there with the queens. One of them uh, hiding behind the Overlord, but apparently Rogue still managed to get the click. Yeah, losing four queens is suboptimal. 29 Zerklings is also kind of a lot, but this is all pretty recoverable. Thing is, Terran usually isn't going to be too aggressive now for another minute or two, unless these, uh, you know, upgrades are timed very differently. Um, he shouldn't really be too aggressive here for a while, and... That should give Rogue at the very least an opportunity to start droning up his fourth base, and you know, he's reading this correctly. He goes for a base right over here at the six o'clock position too. Okay, creep spread by the way. Look at it. It's good. It's very good. Yeah, we could certainly spread a little bit more over here, but honestly, he's playing fast. He's he's playing some good Starcraft here again. Yeah. I'm excited, man. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I have been... I've been watching Rogue games for literally a decade. And it's always a bit sad. Like, I find myself actually being a bit sad the day that pro gamers leave to go to the military. Because ultimately, I'm just a massive StarCraft nerd and I enjoy watching the best of the best compete. I remember, for example, when Zest went off to the military and... You know, I kind of figured that Protoss was going to have a hard time moving forward. And it turns out... <laughs> <laughs> Protoss has had a little bit of a hard time moving forward. Obviously, right now, Stats is playing really well. Hero is playing really well. There's a bunch of really good players. Max Pax at the time also wasn't quite as dominant as he is right now, but... Yeah. Singular players can actually make an entire difference as far as the perceived balance of the game goes. It is kind of wild. This push over here from Oliveira is also kind of wild. Look at that. Seed Tanks on the high ground. Marines on the low ground. Banelings, though, do have their little roly-poly upgrade. I wonder what Roke is gonna do, by the way, on the back of this. So we don't have any other tech, do we? Oh no, we do have a Hydralisk then. Okay. Yeah, so this is technically a little old school. Hydraling Bane, still a common unit composition, still very powerful, but these days, usually we see a faster Hive in favor of Vipers and then obviously Lurkers too. Ah, oh, this positioning is glorious though. Well done by Oliveira. Yeah, Siege Tank deals a bit of uh, friendly fire, and ultimately all of this will be pushed back, but a very costly exchange once again, although apparently we're donating Metavex. Why are we donating Metavex? Not quite optimal. 126 Zerklings down the drain so far. There is, of course, a fourth command center with this, so this is not one of those old-school triple command center all-ins. Those are still, of course, also played from time to time, but... Yeah, not quite as popular as you really yeah, would maybe say. So this is a infestation pit timed together with the 2-2 upgrades. That is the go-to standard in StarCraft 2 for many years, but these days we do usually see faster infestation pits than this. It is actually kind of wild, because this is still going to be like a 9, maybe 9.5 nine minute hive or so here for Rogue. Assuming he fires it up as soon as the infestation pit is done. But that is actually quite late in modern SC2. Yeah. That's a funny statement, because that really was never the case, but I guess the Baneling nerf really has forced Xurx to go around the map a little bit and try out different strategies and, you know, really adjust their build orders. But you know what? Sometimes we, like, accept certain meta changes as factual, right? And we all decide collectively that, hey, going for 2-2 upgrades and then a Hive is no longer a quote-unquote viable way to play. But there's a very good chance that Roke is going to check those, you know, established quote-unquote rules, right? Those are just decisions that players have made over the last year and a half, and it may not even be entirely correct. He's setting up a massive surround right now, by the way. Eh, he does need to be careful. Those thick new Widow Mine lines are really helping out. Siege Tank on the high ground is going to get killed easy-peasy, but a bunch of Hydras here caught without the rest of the army. Without Banes, this is going to be quite difficult to control. Lurker Den is coming up right now. Hive is about halfway done, a little bit more than that, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. But if it's up to Oliveira, he wants to continue putting on pressure. 
Fifth Command Center starts up. Sixth Command Center coming up. We're going Ghost Academy. We're going three additional CCs. All right. Apparently, we are just happily playing the macro game here. Yeah. Big Zerkling Swell going across the map. Much easier, by the way, now to see those Widow Mine lines. So this is one of the most recent adjustments to the game. About maybe a week and a half to two weeks old or so. Uh, maybe two weeks at this point. I'm not exactly sure. There goes Brenda. Do -do -do. Floating to the surface of Oceanborn. Every night in yeah, I dream of Brenda. What are you gonna do about it, huh? What are you gonna do about it? Hit the like button? Okay. Okay, you know what? Yeah, you can do that about it. Lurkers are coming! Rogue has managed to survive. And this is that stage in the game that usually Zerg players are, yeah, pretty happy with, right? So when you get to this particular point where your lurkers are just about to finish, you get your adrenal glands going, this is where you can start breathing again. Everything up to this point has been mostly about survival and maybe killing a couple SCVs whenever you do like a Ling or a Bane roll by, but yeah, overall, this has mostly just been survival. And I guess that's one of the reasons why Zergs are so focused on going into that hive quicker, because then it means that you can start actually, you know, playing the macro game and being aggressive a bit easier too. Nidus Worm coming up? Okay. So, Nidus in the main base with Lurkers. Very popular. Kind of difficult to pull off on this particular map. And you can see that Oliveira here already prepared. He's expecting that there is going to be an Overseer crossing the Northern Wall right over here. In the meantime, though, big fight over here on Creep. Rogue actually smashes that army. I'm a little surprised Oliveira allowed himself to get caught out that far. You know what? This is actually a killer moment right here for Rogue. There's a good chance, he needs detection, but there's a very good chance he can deal crippling amounts of damage. He's going to burrow all of the lurkers. SCVs are falling left, right, and center. So this is right as Terran is in the middle of that ghost transition. Overseer comes up, but we're very late on Nematized Carapace, which is Overlord's speed. I think ultimately this can be defended. But these are the moments, right? Where with a little bit of practice, a little bit of build refinement, it's just simply game over. 26 confirmed kills, by the way, here for that single siege tank. Say, for example, there was one, I don't know, one Viper. Or we had the Overseer speed upgrade done, right? Like, those little adjustments really can make all the difference in a game. And we had some suboptimal traits, too. I can imagine that's because Rogue is not too familiar with... Even though this is a map that for us, right, if you've been watching a lot of StarCraft, if you've been playing a bunch of StarCraft, this map is something we're all very familiar with, but I can imagine these, all these nine maps are, yeah, new for Rogue, or at the very least, new as far as competitive play goes. So there's quite a bit to learn. Yeah. I'm impressed. I, this is kind of sick. Maybe Dark and Cero are going to be leaving us for their military service, but... Where one door closes, apparently a new door <laughs> opens. And it may just be Rogue. Okay, plus three, plus three coming up. We have some Ling Bane Hydra play on the right side of the map. Bane Links trying to go after this base over here. I think they're going to take the SCVs down instead. Great stuff. Planetary, though, does also fall in the process upon seeing these reinforcing Terran units run towards the left side. Push over here does get deflected. All right, and I do think that this hatch at the bottom of the map is in a world of trouble. Yeah, that entire Zerk army is caught on the other side of the map. Without any Banes, it's going to be really difficult to get much done. I do think that Rogue has been taking a bit too much damage from those Widow Mines. Yeah, once again, big detonations right there in favor of the Terran. No Lurkers, by the way, in this unit comp right now, but yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah, very scrappy. Very scrappy, actually. Good split right there on the Hydra. Ultimately, no detection. Again. So the ghosts currently are cloaked. And they're having a grand old time. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah. I wonder if this is also going to be one of those moments for uh, Oliveira, though, where he was assuming, wait a second, this was supposed to be an easy match for today. I can imagine it would be very frustrating if you are an active competitor yourself and you go up against a guy who should be very rusty 
and you still have to struggle this much. This is definitely not a lost game yet though for Oliveira, because he's building up that late game army. And just like in that series against Nightmare, Rogue is kind of forcing himself to get stuck on Lingbane Hydra right now. So rather than continuing his late game progression, say for example going to Ultras or more Lurkers or Vipers or Infestors or any of those late game tools, he's just sort of sitting around here on like a an early-ish late game army, you know? Like kind of what we need to see right now is a late late game army. So we do see a late late game army right here for Oliveira, who is going into those Liberators together with the Ghosts. Of course, this does allow a lot of mobility right here for the Swarm. That nah, was a commitment. And that commitment was a whiff. Not ideal there whatsoever. Nice trade for Oliveira. Okay. Do we have advanced ballistics? Not yet. We do have a Liberator over here being annoying. Shutting down some of the mining. Good split. Stealing his base up here, by the way, is a bit of an interesting one, too. Usually, Zerks will go after this particular expansion. Obviously, that's one he had a little while ago, but rather than trying to, yeah, defend it, he's decided to just go for the base here that normally is considered to be one of the Terrans. I guess that means that this hatch... Okay, well, we're gonna retake that. I was just gonna say, I, I thought that this base right over here was gonna be for the Terran then eventually. I don't believe Rogue can run up the high ground, but I do believe that he thinks he can. <laughs> okay, well, we'll find out who's correct. A lot of Hydraling Bane, though. This is not the entirety of the Terran army. Backs up to the safety of the Planetary Fortress. Excellent split right here against the Banes, at the very least as far as the army goes. A lot of damage done, though, right here to the Command Center as well as those SCVs. Additional Banelings just finished morphing in. I think they were supposed to go and finish off the Planetary, but it is already gone. Problem is, compared to a year and a half ago, killing a Planetary like that is not quite optimal anymore, because Terrans will have about a half dozen Command Centers ready to replace any lost CCs. So Terrans nowadays, they max out and then they really add on additional Command Center after Command Center after Command Center, and that's a really cool style to play. Very powerful, though, because it makes those Baneling rollbys not nearly as threatening anymore. These circles here also really helping out. We don't have any Vipers in the mix. And there's no there's no easy army right here that Rogue can really use to get within a range of those lips. Luckily right here, saving grace for Rogue is that these, these Liberators don't actually have advanced ballistics. So they don't have their ranged upgrade. So I think what he's trying to do here is just overwhelm it with Hydrolink Bank. That is the current plan. New Planetary Fortress coming up over here on the left side of the map. A lot of fresh mules here. Those SCVs are yeah, going to be in a bit of trouble, too, with those max, uh, maxed out Zerklings. Okay. Oliveira does indeed decide to back off. Drones have arrived at the base in the top right-hand corner of this map. Yeah, honestly, my only criticism right here for Rogue's playstyle is that he is playing builds that are slightly outdated. The strategic decisions that he's made here are considered to be... Eh, old-ish. So now we go back to Lurkers. So this is... There's basically been one moment where he made Lurkers here, and then he's transitioned to watch full Hydraling Bane. Now he realizes that he does need Lurkers, but there's no... There's no Vipers and no Infestors, and I really think that preferably both, but at the very least, one of those two tools is absolutely pivotal. Command Center is going to be taken down here at the bottom of the map. This will be scouted as well by Rogue. We're gonna go a full counterattack instead? Okay. A YOLO push straight through the center of the map. I kind of like it, because it's gonna be difficult here for Terran to really cross the path with the Lurkers. So far, it looks like Oliveira is just kind of pushing over here at the front. He's gonna have to go back home, though, I would imagine. I also would imagine that Rogue would rather park his Lurkers over there, rather than over here on the low ground. Yeah, I mean, this is scary looking, but not actually that scary for Oliveira, unless he decides to jump it. I don't think he should. I mean, we're gonna, okay, shoot a couple of Banelings and pop a couple Lurkers, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> that looked scary, but only really if Terran just stimpacked and attack moved in there. Good patience right there, of course, by the Chinese Terran. Command Center here at the bottom of the map, okay, it's gonna be attacked by that defending Lurker that was right over there a little bit ago. 
killing quite a few SCVs in the process. Now the bio army that was left over has decided to go all the way towards the top right hand corner. New hatchery here that was previously the fourth base, wasn't it, for the Terran. Is apparently gonna now be taken by the Zerg. Planetary Fortress on the left side of the map is being overwhelmed. Rogue still with a very solid supply advantage. He's sort of making this work. 20 SCVs remain right now for Oliveira. I think he's pretty much dead. Yeah. I don't think he can get away with this against, for example, Clem or Maru. Because those guys, I mean, no disrespect at all to Oliveira, but it's just that both Maru and Clem look so incredibly rigid in the late game. And you're looking at the angles that Zerk can use and you just can't really find any. Seems like Oliveira is leaving maybe a couple of his flanks somewhat exposed and that is ultimately allowing Rogue some fantastic engagements. You know what, game number one, I think it's going in favor of Rogue. <laughs> oh no. Oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be so frustrating for Oliveira. The man won the world championships last year. He knows how to play high-level StarCraft. He knows what he's supposed to do. And yet, he's finding himself in this situation right now where he's got 26 workers. He's got a good army, it's a hundred-ish supply, but it's not even remotely as big as that of the Zerk. And sure, this may be a slightly lower tiered army here for Rogue. It's an early late game army going up against the late late game army. But the late, ga late game army is also not quite that powerful anymore. With only three liberators and never liberator range. Fight right here on creep. I mean, this creep is basically on the front door right now of the Chinese Terran player. Who's desperately trying to cloak all of those ghosts. GG is called. It's a Rogue who wins game number one. Alrighty, well here we go, game number two. We find ourselves on the map Golden Aura. I have fast forwarded through the first two minutes of the game just because everything was very normal. We've got a drone right here, hiding on the left side of the map as well. It's gonna turn into a hatchery in just a moment. Six Zerklings once again for the base defense. Roke apparently making the benefit of the doubt. Usually, uh, usually you go for four Zerklings here. Sometimes you see players go up to six, especially when they play against, for example, Bjorn or, for example, Clem. But apparently Rogue just defaulting to six. So usually what the top level Zergs do, or at least what they used to do against guys like, for example, those two Terrans that I just mentioned, is they blindly make four Zerglings. That's the normal. And then if the first Overlord scouts that there is a Reaper going across the map, they will add a third set of links. Because you really don't want to go... Oh my god, I don't know if you could hear that. My cat just sneezed behind me. Are you okay, Milo? <laughs> Suddenly there's a massive cat sneeze in my background. I don't think you actually heard it. Pretty sure my microphone filters that sort of thing out. Anyways, what I was saying? Oh yeah, right. So you, you either go like four Zerklings by default, because you don't want to go six links against a Marine-based opener. Usually though, it is going to be that good old Reaper first. Double energy bay, nice and early right here for Oliveira. Third command center, nice and early. That does mean that we have a wide open natural and no starport yet. So this is a very greedy style right here from Oliveira. Against any sort of roach aggression, any sort of pressure from the Zerg really, you probably just straight up lose. And that is a bit of a coin flip. Because Rogue is a very abusive player. Clearly, he likes to do the same strats over and over and over again. And I think that's what Oliveira is assuming right over here, too. That this is indeed going to be the, well, basically same build order as what we saw in game number one of this series. But any sort of aggression right now? Ooh, good scout. Uh, he doesn't get to see the NG base. That would have been a clear-cut decision right there, but... Yeah. I mean, it's already a bit too late right now, to be fair. Like, if you want to go for Roach Aggression, I think you want to put down your Roach Warren at latest, at about the four-minute mark. Any later than that, and it really becomes like a macro Roach Warren instead. Although it doesn't really look like Rogue wants to play that. We've got a Safety Spore Crawler, four and a half-ish minutes into the game. Over on the left side of the map, I'm assuming there's going to be one over here in the main base, too, in just a moment. That'll be for a Liberator Defense and any sort of Benchies that might be flying across the map. There indeed it is. Thank you for making me look smart, Rogue. Appreciate that. Okay, so there's the lair coming up. And I'm assuming we're going to see Banelinks. Banelink Nest, that is, as well as double evolution chamber in just a moment. There's the Banelink Nest. There's another Spore Crawler. 
And then the last game he added on all of the gas as well at once, a fourth hatchery here at some point, and then a double Evo. In the meantime, though, on the other side of the map, yeah, this is... Yeah, this is this is a greedy style right here from Oliveira. So he's already gotten away with murder. He's already survived the scariest part of this match. He's managed to get himself a very good economy for this phase in the game. And he's just gonna power out a ton of workers now. So we are talking... Yeah, three barracks done at this point with a bunch more finishing up. So three plus two? I know. I, I, I can I can calculate this because I've got that amount of fingers on each hand, so I can easily figure it out. He's gonna be able to get a solid amount of production going here very soon. We're even gonna add on more. Okay, so I brought up, I believe, in the previous game that an 8 racks all in on 3 Command Center, not very popular anymore in 2024, but certainly still something that is technically viable. Perfect timing right there as well in the armory. We should see 2-2 two, two start up right about right now. Roll all of the R's, come on! Hello. Okay. Well, we timed it perfectly. Ah, there we go. Only to delay it a little bit later. Okay, so what this ultimately is gonna come down to is Oliveira going for an all-in with plus two, plus two, triple command center, and just a stupid amount of Marines. There's gonna be an insane number of Marines marching across the map. Apparently, Oliveira picked up on some sort of weakness in that previous game. So remember when he first went across the map in the previous match with that Siege Tank Medivac push? When he first went across the map with like the early mid-game attack, he found himself in a really good position, right? And Rogue managed to survive, but only just barely. So I think Oliveira is looking at that previous game and he's thinking, yo, if I would have committed a little bit harder to that same attack, I should end up with a massive advantage. So let's see. 1-1 one, one here, much later for the Zerk, of course. Bailing speed is already done. Hydra is then once more, so this is essentially just a one-to-one -one copy of the previous game. My main concern right here is when Terran finishes up 2-2, because I don't really see how Rogue is easily gonna be able to hold on there. So we've got already a significant army advantage, and that's only gonna get bigger over the next couple minutes here. We have a Bailing roll by. If this is well defended, Roke is in a world of trouble. Okay, he decides to back off. That right there, by the way, is the hallmark of a great player. Committing to an attack and then deciding halfway through. Nope. We're not doing it. That is something that I personally suck at. I am very uh, pot committed in StarCraft 2, to use a poker term, you know? I, <laughs> I want to see. I want to see the next card. I want to see the turn. I want to see the flop. I want to see what is coming up next. And I've committed to the push, so I guess I'm playing it. It's a bad habit, and I know it very well, but Rogue instantly backing up right there is a good sign. All right, so here comes Oliveira. Army is massive. 2-2 two, two not yet done, by the way, so right now the upgrades are even. He should probably wait a little bit longer. 14, 12 seconds right now on these upgrades finishing up, or at least one of them. Ah, this is a brilliant fight, though. Yeah. Oh, accidental swarm host comes up. And this, this is a scary attack. I think his best bet, Rogue that is, is just to make a stupid amount of banes and try to overwhelm this. But a hatchery over here is in a world of trouble. Hatchery up north also in a bit of trouble. Large Zerkman counterattack, which actually, I was gonna say, could deal a lot of damage and at the very least, put this build on a bit of a timer. So we have a split off, some of the links going into natural, some of them going into the third. In the meantime, there's a push over here up front as well though, Bane links. Yeah, finding targets, but not really anything all too juicy. Great play right there by Oliveira. That stim pack was brilliant. That positioning right there of the army was pretty much flawless. The swarm host activates the locust, but I think that that is basically game. Next up, we find ourselves on the map Dynasty. So now we've got ourselves a proper series. Rogue One game number one. Oliveira managed to gather a lot of information from that particular game, and he used that info against Rogue in the second match of this series. So will Oliveira play the same style as he did in the previous game? Will Rogue make any significant adjustments in his strategic decision making here? So what he, for example, could have done is maybe focus a little bit more on the Overseer scouting, so... Essentially what he did is he assumed that it was going to be a fourth command center there nice and early Just like what we saw in game number one because everything looked relatively similar albeit a little bit more greedy I suppose, but 
Is he gonna go and do a roach attack? Is he gonna do a Ling Flood? He's skipping the gold base. That's an interesting one. Maybe he hasn't seen this map before. Um, there's an in-base gold base over here. And then, well, there's that rich Vespian geyser if you decide to take it a little bit later on the other end of that wall. Hmm. I've got a feeling, though. Yeah, look at the amount of income here that Mr. Oliveira is going to be able to gather here early on. I mean, he is going to go triple command center and then eventually into a starport. I'm assuming there will be a tech lab here in just a moment. We'll see the big switcheroo. So this is a safe way to start off with triple CC. And, I mean, it's safe in a way that, like, Zerk could still harass you from the back here, but I don't think he's really going to be able to overwhelm you. Unless he decides to plant down a Roach Warren right now, I don't think Roke is really going to go for any sort of aggression either. And that means that Oliveira is once again able to get away with, well, quite a bit of greed. Ah, it's going to be a Viking first. Hmm... Viking first into the good old cloaking upgrade. Yeah. Believe it or not, Vikings can't cloak. That would be insane. Terran players would love that, but... <laughs> no cloaked Vikings in this game, I'm afraid. That is only gonna count for the Banshee. Zorkling over here, trying to blend into the mineral line. Quite literally invisible, dude. This is kind of like how toddlers play hide and seek. You know, when they're standing behind the curtain and... Their, their feet are sticking out from the bottom, or how my cats like to hunt. Very frequently, they think if their head is hidden, they're basically invisible to any sort of prey. Brilliant stuff, really, by that circling. Yeah. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't that smart after all. There's the Baining Nest once again. Do we have a lair yet? Uh, we should get a lair. Why did we go Baining Nest before lair? Why did we go banning this before lair? Ah, now we fire up the lair. Maybe he's a little afraid of a big attack, but that's a bit funky. Because now the timings here are out of whack, and usually... Like, you don't you don't really make banelings without bane speed, usually. Unless you assume that something very aggressive is coming, and it's like your last-ditch effort. Now suddenly a bunch of Hellions just show up. Quite scary, really, because these guys can, well, roast a mineral line in just a matter of seconds if you give them a chance. I've never actually seen anybody take this base from this site. Yeah. So this was the original design for the map. Every single game that I've seen so far have had players just fast expanding to the gold base because it seems so obvious, but apparently a rogue is going to try and make use of the rich Vespian geyser. So rather than taking the, the slim one right over there, we take the rich one from the other site. Especially for Terran, I guess. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because if you really want to have the rich geyser, you can just... Fly the command center to the other side after this, this area is mined out. Okay, so no real adjustments here from Rogue, other than the fact that this is a slightly worse start. Because of the lair timing, I guess. Overseer is coming though. Cloak Banshees, not achieving anything really thus far. Transfusion? Transfusion! Oh, there we go. Yep, lovely play. Alien run by over here attempted, but not really... Yeah, achieving all too much. There is one queen in the main base and no creep connecting this section. So these queens are actually going to be in a little bit of trouble. Additional barracks coming up. There's the combat shields and the armory also is going to start up at a reasonable time. Okay. So this is really about as standard as it can be, right? So once more, we're just playing the macro game. There are a lot of curveballs that Zerk can throw to Terran too. So, especially once you get to that lair tech, right? You have a lot of different options. This time around, we don't seem to have a Hydralisk then. We don't have a Spire. We don't have an Infestation Pit. So that kind of means to me that Rogue just wants to go Ling Bane. And maybe, yeah, making an extra hatchery over here is not so much for droning. But maybe it's mostly just for larva generation for now. There's the Infestation Pit. So maybe this is him actually going into Ultras. Start up 2-2, go into Ultras as quickly as possible, and try and see if you can maybe win the game with that. That does mean, though, that that overwhelming aggression that Terrans are so fond of is going to be very scary. Because usually at some point the Lurkers come out and then you can kind of defend against everything. Or at least that tempo advantage that Terran created for themselves can be nullified. It's critical here for Rogue that he does not get overwhelmed, because he does not have Lurkers coming. 
Here's the Terran Biobull, ready to go for a move out. We've got ourselves just three command centers once again, by the way. So this is once more a triple command center, eight Rex all in. Different way of getting there compared to game number one. Rogue decides to just simply meet it head on in the middle of the map. That does mean that some of this fight takes place off creep. I don't think I love it. Nope. Cool attempt right there by Rogue. Got me excited for just a moment, but ultimately we're allowing the Terran to split significantly easier. Lovely micro right there, of course, by Oliveira as well. Inviting that attack. He said, yo, if that's what you want to do, be my guest. Go ahead, give it a try. See how it goes for you. So Rogue was hoping he could catch his opponent off guard. Bailings. Okay. Good target firing right over there by those Marines. I think they did it by themselves. Don't even really have to click the Bane links, and now a lot of queens are going to fall. And this is very tricky when you're playing Ling Bane, because you need a lot of larva generation, and at this point only two queens remain. GG immediately called, it's Oliveira who wins game number three. Crimson Court is going to be game number four. I think Rogue pretty much had all of the tools at his disposal to hold that attack, but then... <sighs> Sometimes you try to get cheeky, right? And you're like, ha, huh, I'm gonna catch my opponent off guard. And then ultimately, you just kind of look like a fool because you're fighting your opponent off creep now. And, you know, life is not quite as easy <laughs> as you expected it to be. So, another 8 Rex all in. Yeah, Roke is... Or, sorry, uh, Oliveira is quite fond of that particular style. The other top-tier Terrans don't really seem to play it that much anymore. I don't remember the last time I've seen, for example, Maru play a, a triple CC all in. I'm sure he mixes it in from time to time, but Oliveira certainly likes to bring it out whenever he feels like it's a good opportunity. I don't actually know if the build is that strong. <laughs> it's one of those weird things where, like, I'm not convinced that the build is actually that good, but it may be good because it's so infrequently played at the pro level that nobody really sees it that often, so you don't have as much practice against it. Because if Zerk knows that it's coming, they can just stop droning a little earlier. They can stop focusing all that tech a little earlier, too, and just make a ridiculous amount of Ling Bane. And then Terran just sort of, yeah, fizzles out over the course of the next five minutes. Because if that attack is held with minimal losses, then suddenly Zerk is going to dominate the map. Anyways, triple CC once again. Got ourselves a good old, well, 1-1-1 one, one, one opener on the back of it. So it's going to be Hellion Banshee. Identical style here so far from Oliveira. Yep. No Viking this time around with cloaking, but it is going to be a straight Benchy. But broadly speaking, basically identical. So, Roke has now fallen for the same trick twice. Albeit in a bit of a different way, I guess, right? So, nothing really all too crazy, I guess. It's just, uh... Yeah, an uncommon build order that he probably hasn't seen in, like, two years. Well, we'll see. Is he going to make any adjustments now? Because if I was Oliveira, I'd probably just do the same thing again. Yeah. If Roke is unable to defend it so far, either because he jumps the gun early or because he just doesn't really know exactly how to play against it, or he just doesn't... Okay, we have an, uh, a transition. Okay, fair. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Uh, we had ourselves a Roach Warren there for just a moment, and then the Roach Warren magically turned into a Bailing Nest. Again, a Bailing Nest, by the way, before Lair. I don't love it. I really don't think that's the best way to play it, but fair enough. Gas is coming up once more. I'm assuming we're gonna take some more gas up here. He's mining out all of the skinny little mineral fields, by the way. Probably planning on taking some additional bases there. Lair fires up at exactly five minutes on the dot. Here go the Hellions. There should be the Benchies as well. Third command center flying on over down towards the low ground. We have Barracks 2 and 3 just fired up here for the Terran. Oh, and the Hellions actually do find an angle. Hmm, okay. Ten drones for that many Hellions is nice. Ish. Sort of. I'm not in love with it though. So, when you see those Hellions being sacrificed, yeah, exactly. Like, that is a gigantic sign to the Zerg that it is going to be a normal macro game with a fourth command center. It is kind of silly, maybe, but, like, you, you really don't want to lose what could have been, like, 10 hell bets with, you know, your main all-in. So, if you're going to go for an all-in, like, giving away a bunch of units like that indirectly tells the story of what you're planning on doing in the rest of the game. 
So it is indeed going to be a fourth command center. I don't think those drones really paid for the Hellions. I mean, it's okay. But I really don't think the information that you give away with it for free is... Yeah, really worth it. Even though it's a good number of drones. It's just that killing 10 drones at like 5 minutes is not quite the same as killing it at like 3 minutes, you know? Because percentually you can replace it pretty easy. Now this is quite nice though. That Overseer way far away for some reason. Okay, this is phenomenal right here for Oliveira. Ay ay ay. Suddenly we're talking 21 drones killed. His base over here is a little exposed. Okay, Mule goes down. One SCV goes down. That's about it. Good reaction speed right there by Ollie. Can I call you Ollie? <laughs> Ollie Vera is so long, you know. Rogue. I guess that's technically one syllable. Yeah, it's funny because it's a uh, it's a lot of characters for a single syllable, but rogue. Yeah, English works funny like that. Although I guess the origins of the word rogue aren't very English. It doesn't I don't know what the origins are, but doesn't look like a Germanic word to me. Anyways, Marines stimming forward, trying their very best to deal some damage. I'm gonna go to the other side of these rocks. Hmm. Second factory coming up over at the third base. You got a lot of value playing those Banelings, or, or sorry, those Terran Banelings, the Widow Mines, earlier in this particular series, in game number one. It seemed like a powerful tool. Wouldn't mind seeing him play some more of that right over here as well. Marines are going to be moving forward. They will try their very best to just deal whatever damage they can, and it turns out they can deal a lot. Yeah, that is not bad here whatsoever. Okay, we've got ourselves the Hydralisk ranged upgrade coming up. Plus two, plus two research here as well for Rogue, and he's just happy to play in a macro game. I would have liked to see a bit of variety. Now, I understand that going back to your basics is a good idea, especially when you're practicing your ladder games, but I think against Oliveira, you're being a bit too predictable now, because this has essentially been the same game. Four games in a row now. Now, let's see. Does he have enough? I think he should have enough to push this back. Yeah. But this is this is starting to be very comfortable right now for Oliveira. The changes to the Zerg have been relatively minor. And, I mean, obviously, if you're looking at this, you're like, well, it's just command centers and marines, Loco. It's the same thing as well for Terran. Not quite. The way that it all plays out is a little different with the command center count and all that. Anyways, now finally we have barracks 6, 7, and 8. I'm assuming we're going to be seeing a Ghost Academy momentarily here as well. Fifth Command Center coming up, Sixth Command Center coming up. Do we already have a Ghost Academy? No, we do not. Usually these guys are going to get little tech labs on them and then Ghost Academy allows them to, uh, well, build the Ghost. I know. I know. Crazy idea. <laughs> Alrighty. Push over here, up towards the high ground. Just leaving some Widow Mines behind as a little present for the Zerk a little bit later on into the game. As we do have Factory number 3 coming up. Interesting. So that is all a little surprising. A lot of Factories, a lot of Command Centers, but no Ghost Academy. I guess he's anticipating that this is going to be Hydraling Bane, and there once again is that late Lurker then. Relatively late Hive as well, compared to what we normally see in this matchup now. So maybe that's also the reason, yeah. I think this is Oliveira saying, yo, if you're not teching up particularly quickly to a hive, if you're not going infestors, vipers, ultras, lurkers, brute lords, I mean, those are all fantastic tools for me. I don't really need the lur like I, I don't really need Ghost Academy, so fair enough, fair game. He purposely delayed it for a little while. I don't think he would have done that in a more standard game. But it works out for him in this man uh, in this match. Okay, well, Lurker then is ultimately going to finish. Siege tank numbers are growing, though. Another command center coming up. We've got double expansion here on the right side of the map, it looks like. Now, I think one of them is going to be an orbital. The other one's going to be a planetary. Either or. Maybe double planetary. Double planetary would actually be kind of cool. I don't think it's very good, but it would be cool. Very difficult for Zerk to break, though. Unless they get Lurkers out, which... 
Broke is just about to. <laughs> the one thing missing in game number one for me was the ranged upgrade for those Liberators. So from Ghost into Liberators, great choice. No cancel. Push over here in the top left hand corner with a little Medivac drop is also... Well, if not reacted to, going to clean up a hatch. We do have a Planetary in the middle of the map getting blown up. Rogue is gonna be able to overwhelm this, okay. Front door wide open. Oh. At least finish off the... okay. At least finish off those supply depots. Push over on the left side, by the way, is gonna continue onwards for a little while longer. So two hatcheries were killed over the last minute or so, make it a third. Not bad right there for Oliveira. Loses a command center and a bunch of SCVs, but yeah. At the cost of a lot of hatcheries too, I think it's okay. Another factory. How many factories do we have now? Oh, actually, he must have lost one. Ah, uh, he, he must have lost one. It is gonna be planetary to get it with an orbital command right over there. And an instant replacement right here for the planetary and orbital command duo that was protecting the middle of the map. Yeah, I think this series is gonna have a similar conclusion as the one that I had when I casted Rogue going up against Nightmare. Rogue still has it. His micro is good, his macro is good, his game decisions are solid. He's just playing a little- oh, would you look at that? Well, he's already making adjustments. We got ourselves a Viper in the mix. I was gonna say he's just playing a little bit of an older style. And it can still certainly work. It may just be working in this particular game. But overall, it seems like the top tier Zerks have decided that there are slightly better ways to play. Suddenly, there's Kales everywhere, though. Drop over on the right side of the map. Okay, this one will get shut down with the reinforcements. Benchy's up north, still pulling in a bit of work. We have some Marines and Ghosts helping each other out over here with the Metavex providing some support from the skies. The entirety of the Zerg ball, though, has been pushed back because, well, at this point, Rogue really can't afford losing another base. He's remaking some hatcheries, it looks like, but I think this one is basically toast. Yeah. That's a lot of hatches going down. Four hatcheries falling here. Honestly, killing four hatcheries may be the only reason why Oliveira is still alive in this game, to be honest. Because he killed a lot of stuff. With a relatively small amount of units of his own. Oh. Late game Widowmine drop. Also, a relatively recent thing. Okay, Rogue is going to react. Keep in mind that with the new multiplayer balance patch, those Widow Mines deal a little bit less splash damage than they used to. Or less splash damage, rather. Not less. Less splash damage. <laughs> Alright. Oliveira trying to play a bit of a slower game now. Yeah, he's forced into this position where he needs to play this a little bit more calmly. You know what? He's doing a great job. Push over here at the bottom of the map. Command center already up in the sky. Obviously, you cannot lift a planetary fortress, but you can lift that orbital command. Okay. Not 26 SCVs, though, and it's not even the end of it yet. Loads of Zerklings dealing a lot of damage. Another hatchery fell in the middle of the map, too. Okay. Siege tank. Okay. Fresh out of the factory. Immediately surrounded. A lot of chaos. A lot of chaos around the map. Looks like Oliveira is relatively comfortable though, but I'm not 100% sure if he should be. Because now we're once again in a very similar situation as we were in game number one. With a terrible economy right here for the Terran. And a solid amount of income still for Rogue. Sure he may have lost a lot of hatcheries. But we're talking 75 drones versus only 37 SCVs for Terran. A couple of those expensive ghosts left behind as well. There was still room in the plane, but I guess we didn't want to risk it. Now, he does still have the orbital command numbers. Yeah, we're still talking five orbitals. So even though he has lost uh, one orbital command and two planetary fortresses, as well as a regular CC, the economy is actually not that bad right now for the Terran. Another massive Zorkling run by, though, towards the bottom of the map. You love to see it. Puts in a lot of work. Okay. Yeah, these Zorkling run bys have been absolutely lethal. Rogue taking a page out of uh, Rainer's book, who's also a big fan of those big Zorkling swells towards the bottom of the map. Still though, the main fight, yeah, going really well actually for Oliveira. 
Like, his army is massive compared to that of the Zerg. A couple of overlords now. Miss rallied in this direction. Link's trying to see if they can potentially catch a couple of the reinforcing Terran units as they make their way across the map. Good fight over here, though, for the Zerg, but... I don't know if it's quite enough. Push over here at the front as well. Still going on. Oliveira actually just holds his ground. Bit of long distance mining over here as well for the Zerg player as that expansion just fell. Okay, he needs to back off to the safety of the Siege Tank. Siege Tank's 35 confirmed kills, 37 in total before it ended up going down. Brenda over there takes a round of that uh, Ghost Rifle in the back. Orbital Command once again landed. Loads of SCVs went down in total though. 77 of them were killed in this game. Okay. If Rogue can stabilize, he's in a phenomenal spot. That's why he keeps on pushing here with these Zerglings, just to try and create some chaos. Another hatchery does end up falling though. I think he needs to make a bunch of Banelings at home and just really make sure that this army does not get any more additional value. Okay. Yep, get the surround. There is enough room in the plane now for most everyone. Okay. I mean, there's... Hmm. You know what? The worker count is good for Rogue, but he actually doesn't have a lot of mining. So it's a weird moment where, like, yeah, he's got seven, he's 62 workers, but he's heavily oversaturated in the bases that he's got. A lot of these guys are going to be forced to long distance mine as well. So the economy here for Oliveira with those... I think it's four or so orbital commands that he still has. Yeah, he actually has an economical advantage, despite the fact that Rogue has nearly twice the amount of workers. Which is a very weird phenomenon, but with the way that Oliveira has been playing it, he must know that he's on a timer. Yep, just trying to lean in that economy a little bit, get some additional energy on some of those medevacs, heal the army back up, and then I think he has to go for one final play. Will he capture it or will he let it slip? The Marines are weak and sweaty. His arms are heavy. Or, but no, close enough. Couple of lurkers here being a nuisance. Although these are expensive units to make. GG is cold. Oh no. What? Wait, 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 wait. Was that game over? I'm gonna go back to the moment where. Okay, he GG's out. So there's a drop going on here on the right side of the map. There's a Zirkling run by here, clearing out pretty much all of the Z Hmm. Uh, I don't think this game was quite decided yet. I mean, it's pretty much over. Don't get me wrong. I think Roke has been very frustrated here for a while because he doesn't have much, right? His income is pretty terrible. This base is just about to fall. Ah, I think he's right. No, I think this is pretty much over. Problem right here for Roke is that, that, that he doesn't have any Banelings. If he had 10 Banelings here, he would be, I think, able to defend. I would have loved to see this one play out for another minute or so, but... Yeah, I think Roke is correct. It is a slightly early GG, but despite the fact that Oliveira is losing literally everything at home as far as his economy goes, I do believe he actually obtains the victory here in this game. Hmm. Crazy. Maybe he could have afforded another Lurker? Ah, it's just one Hydra. <laughs> it's just... Nah, there's no easy way out. Site Delta is next. Match point right here for Oliveira. Although I'm almost feeling like we're seeing improvement as these games go by. Am I crazy? Like, Rogue really did play a stellar game. I think if he would have managed his economy slightly differently... So he had way too much gas there in the bank in the end, and he didn't really make any investors, right? So he could have either just mined less gas, taken his expansions in a different pattern, or just made some small minute adjustments. And I think it would have been fine. I think it would have actually had a, yeah, dominating performance there. So despite the fact that <laughs> he won game number one and I was very impressed, I actually think game number, what was it, four was better for him, despite the fact that he ended up losing that game. Like that was in my mind the more dominant performance. Even though game number one was a win and game number four was a loss. Anyways. It is indeed Oliveira, who of course ended up winning there. But he probably also had a bit of a... A bit of a question mark in his head as soon as he saw the GG coming in. Because I'm fairly sure that he was on his last leg there for like four minutes. And he's like, well, I still haven't finished him off. Like, I've been all in for a while and I... Hmm. Usually, if you're all-in is a bit extended, it, it ultimately falls flat on its face. But the amount of economy that he destroyed... Like, I really love the target firing right there on the hatcheries. It's uncommon, because usually Terrans will go for guaranteed damage, right? So they will try and kill the 
workers, in this particular case, the drones, rather than the hatcheries themselves. Because, well, killing the hatchery is nice, but it's a big commitment. Whereas killing the drones, usually you can have more of like a, yeah, guaranteed damage, right? But he decided to go after the hatcheries and he killed like half a dozen of them. And ultimately that put him in a really nice position, but, hmm. It also put him on a timer, because as soon as those hatcheries finished up again, obviously there would have been a ton of an economical advantage. For the Zerg, so he needed to keep going. And I think that that final push, I think he... He was pretty close. I think he was like 80% of the way to GGing out himself. <laughs> Anyhow. With a bit more minerals, a couple more minerals there, a few more bailings, another lurker or two. I think there was a chance for the Zerg to win, but alas. 3cc opener. Hellion Banshee, Stimpak on the back of it. You're well familiar with this now. Roachworn coming up right here for Rogue. Okay. So, predictability has been thrown out of the window. I can almost guarantee you, though, that he feels far less comfortable playing this than what we have been seeing so far in this particular series. Lair coming up much earlier, too, it seems. Eh, much earlier, a little bit earlier. Game is actually now five minutes into it. I have been blabbering onwards. I actually thought we were still at like minute four, but not quite the case. Okay, Spore Crawler's coming up. Lair is gonna be yeah, finishing nice and early. Curious to see what he will do with the Roach Warren, though, because there's no Bingling Nest here. So it's become pretty popular to go Roaches into ultimately Ling Bane. We see players like Serral, Dark, Raynor. We see them playing that all the time. The problem right here is that it's also quite a tricky transition to go for. It looks like once more we've got ourselves a lot of barracks here on the production tab. Not going up to 8 just yet, but we'll have to see what he decides to go for right now when the 4th and the 5th one finishes up. Is he going to spend his additional money on more barracks or are we going to go for another CC? There's road speed. Fourth hatchery coming up. So I think Roke is really just going to play these roaches defensively. He could go for like an all-out attack as well. If he decides to fire a plus one missile. Yeah, there it is. He could finish up these upgrades right around the same time and just push with a massive army. I may actually go for like a roach all-in. That'd be kind of cool. If that's the case, he should start making non-stop roaches right about right now. Until all these three upgrades are done and then attack. It's very powerful, especially against a... And there's the additional barracks. Yeah, especially against this particular style right here from Oliveira. Rogue could also just make a bunch of roaches defensively and then drone on the back of it. That is also a very viable play. Here come the Benchies. Yeah, trying to get something done, but not really achieving all too much. Okay, so... It's gonna be another triple command center all in right here for our Terran player. Armory coming up. We should see 2 2 as quickly as these upgrades are done. Obviously, with the new patch, since these upgrades are a bit cheaper and the armory itself is also cheaper, maybe this is a style that will actually gain a bit of traction once again, because it does mean that you will ultimately hit slightly harder, right? Because you can squeeze out a couple more units in the time that you normally would have been building uh, those upgrades. Or you would have been spending your resources on upgrades instead, so... Small adjustment, but maybe that's the reason why Oliveira is experimenting with this... Yeah, build order. Triple CC all in. I don't think it's gonna be the most popular style at the highest level, but... Now, if you're a, a ladder hero, and you wanna try and mix it up against Zerg, I think a triple CC... Basically this exact style that Oliveira is playing now in three games of this series, I believe. I think it's a very good plan. There have been some additional drones right here, by the way, for Rogue. So he's got an opportunity to attack. Hmm. I don't know if I love the idea of attacking. So he's making a Baneling transition and a much quicker Hive. Kind of feels like Rogue had a little bit of, you know, in-between coaching here. Maybe somebody sent him a couple of DMs, you know, like in between the games. Like, yo, by the way, nobody's playing what you're doing anymore that often. You should probably go for a Roach Warren for protection and a much faster Hive. He's like, wait, really? Yeah, yeah, you should go Ling Bane with it, too. It's like, all right, I guess I'll give that a shot. Because <laughs> this is... This looks a little bit more modern. Albeit in a, a bit of a strange way, but... All right, so my question is mostly, what will happen when Oliveira goes across the map? 
And I guess we will find out very, very soon. His upgrades do seem to be ever so slightly late. Bailing speed, not yet done, though. I think you have to wait on the high ground. You have to rain biles. Ugh. I don't know if I love this here for a rogue. I really think he should have been protecting the high ground and tried to slow down the advancement right here of the Terran player. Because right now, suddenly, the Terran's creating a chokehold on this base. The triple hooks, though, is done right now. And this is apparently the moment where Rogue pulls the trigger. But does he have enough? I mean, there's a lot of army here still left over for the Zerg player. The initial wave of Banes didn't really achieve that much. Loads of Zerglings on the back of this, too. Some nice corrosive Biles actually missing the Siege Tank. Nice for the Terran, anyways. <laughs> As the rest of the bio army stems forward. GG is cold. And it's ultimately Oliveira who obtains the victory 4-1 over Rogue. Hey, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button down below. It really does help out the channel. By you hitting the like button, this video may very well get promoted to some other people that may also be interested in StarCraft 2. And today I also want to give a special shout out to the Patreon supporters. Thank you guys very much for directly supporting my channel. For now though, have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to smile. And I hope to see you once again very soon for another video.